Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. On this week's show, we're going to discuss a topic that will never see a resolution. It is an argument I have had with dozens of people, dozens of times. Each time, no one walks away satisfied and nothing is accomplished. And yet we're drawn to discussing this question again and again. The topic of today's show is, what's the difference between a crossover and an SUV? Joining me is MotorOne.com senior editor and master of the clever title, Greg Fink. How you doing, Greg? Great. How are you, John? Very good. And making his inaugural appearance on the show, MotorOne.com writer and fellow Ohioan, Chris Bruce. How you doing, Chris? Doing great. Glad to be here for the first time. So as I mentioned, I've had this conversation with uh, dozens of people dozens of times. There is no Webster's Dictionary definition of what a crossover is and what an SUV is. And it only gets more confusing as these vehicles, especially crossovers, become more and more popular and automakers uh, produce more and more vehicles that they call crossovers or that they even call SUVs uh, and keep muddying the waters for the rest of us. I've never captured this conversation um, on tape before, so that's what we're going to do now and see if we can uh, find any common ground, at least between the three of us. So uh, I want to go around the room first and kind of get everyone's just initial take, just initial like first impression of what what makes a crossover a crossover and what makes an SUV an SUV. So Chris, let's start with you. So obviously the classic definition is that a SUV uses a body on frame design, whereas a crossover is monocoque, unibody, whatever you want to call it. To me, that is useless at that at this point and we basically need to abandon that entirely in my opinion it should come down to both uh the designer's goals and the automaker's goals and also the capabilities of a vehicle so if a vehicle can go off road and do it easily and go anywhere that is an suv if it is designed to stay on the road you know maybe only offers front wheel drive not not even an all-wheel drive system then it is a crossover Interesting. So for you, the distinction is between whether it's meant to go off road or meant to stay on road. Correct. Okay. Because what ends up happening is that if you define it just by unibody, you end up throwing out vehicles like a Land Rover Range Rover or a Jeep Grand Cherokee that can definitely off road. No problem. But they're unibody. So in my opinion, you have to abandon that. No, no one would call a Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, a crossover. That I, you know, that's that's really the fr- one of the fringe cases that usually blows up these definitions uh, or these strict categories. Greg, how about you? How do you split these two? I'm going to call the Jeep Grand Cherokee a crossover. Whoa! Because, <laughs> because SUV to me doesn't mean off road ability, and I'm not saying Chris is wrong. It just doesn't fit my definition. SUV means body on frame. Crossover means, you know, that's where we get more in the weeds. What separates a hatchback from a crossover? And a crossover is where off-road ability comes into play. And some of them can be Grand Cherokees. Others can be, I guess there's, we've accepted some front-wheel drive ones in there, like the Kicks and the Soul. And maybe that's because of H-Point. Uh, you know, I kind of- Some go, people haven't. I mean, I know a lot of people who would uh, vehemently argue that the soul is not a crossover yeah the soul is a five-door hatchback it's not a crossover, like chris bruce <laughs> well if, if we were more european here we would call it an mpv it would solve a lot of problems if we would just create the mpv class in our american minds but we don't so to me it goes in crossover i go the justice potter stewart route i know it when i see it and i see that as a crossover oh, nice reference nice reference okay uh let me throw out my distinction because this will be a different one than than both of yours for me, I, I do adhere to the split between body on frame and unibody a little bit, but I would make exceptions to the rule for certain vehicles like the Grand Cherokee and the Range Rover that I feel, while they are unibody, have proven themselves in the spirit of an SUV and deserve that title. However, I let a lot of things into the crossover category that most people wouldn't, like the soul and the kicks that that do not come available with all-wheel drive. For me, the availability of all-wheel drive is immaterial. What's more important to me for a vehicle to be called a crossover is that it is trying to give the impression of an SUV. People want to buy crossovers because they, they give that kind of... Uh, adventurous, masculine, kind of butch impression. 
more than they like the impression that a minivan gives. They give that impression, but then they don't compromise on comfort or fuel economy or things like that. So it's for me, being a crossover is just about a vehicle trying to give the impression of being something like an SUV, but but not under the skin. I, I don't think um, all-wheel drive is necessary because so many things that um, we do call crossovers that offer all-wheel drive, a lot of them, you can get them without all-wheel drive, you know, with just front-wheel drive. And we still call that version of that vehicle a crossover, even though it's front-wheel drive. So I, I don't see how the just the availability of all-wheel drive makes something a crossover. I think you would have to argue that... Um, you know, actually having all wheel drive makes it a crossover if you were going to go that route. Um, but, but man, I, I feel like there's, there's no, there's no perfect box for each, right? So that's why I say you have to make exceptions for a few vehicles to go, to go, um, in one box or the other, um, that would normally violate your rules. Um, and the Jeep Grand Cherokee is, is by far the best example. I, I take it by, your silence, you both agree with me, and the argument is settled. No, no. I want to know where you <laughs> consider the Fiat 500L. I don't consider that a crossover because I think one condition of presenting yourself as a crossover um, and trying to mimic an SUV is having a modicum of, gr of ground clearance. I feel like you can't just be a tall hatchback. You have to, 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 in order to give the impression of an SUV, you actually have to lift yourself off the ground a little bit. And I don't think the Fiat 500L does that. Now, there's lots of vehicles out there, though, that are hatchbacks that try to cheat by having a an off-road looking version and like the, the soul yeah, like or the, the soul, 500l trekking or yeah right the soul x line or the 500l trekking the the soul is a hard one i don't know if i would give the soul the description of being a crossover um, and certainly being an x line doesn't do it even though it's it has some butch elements, you know, it doesn't change the ground clearance or anything like that. So I might be fine with leaving the soul out of the, the crossover category and definitely fine with leaving the 500 L because it has no, no ground clearance. It, that is, that is a true MPV in the European sense. I think my, the, the way I uh, divide these things can handle any vehicle you throw at me. Where would you lump in your Subaru Outback, Audi A6 All-Road, or Audi All-Road yep. General, Mercedes, what do they call there, Terrain, and whatever, Volvo Cross Country. Not those. crossover. I mean, to me, those are not crossovers. Those are jacked up wagons. Yeah, I agree. They live in a world, though, where it's like the Venn diagram of sure, wagon you know, cross and shopping. crossover. So I wouldn't fault somebody for calling it a crossover, but in my world, yeah, that's a jacked up wagon. Okay. I, I think mean, that that's fair. It's just, it's definitely a fringe case where you could easily see someone calling an Outback a crossover. That. I've heard people do it, but I, I bump at it every time I, I hear somebody do that. I think, again, according to my definition, if you're going to try to mimic an SUV, you need to mimic the shape. And a wagon shape isn't quite the same thing. It's longer, it's lower in height. Even if you jack it up, um, off the ground with higher ground clearance, you're, it's still a wagon. Um, so for me, that's not, that's, that's not, uh, doesn't, doesn't tick all the boxes for crossover. So what is the minimum you would consider being ground clearance that gets to a crossover then? Uh, it's tough. Cause you're going to catch me. You're going to catch me with, uh, a cro like, like a, an agreed upon crossover, like an Equinox that has a ground clearance of like five inches because of, you know, some lower front air dam <laughs> or something. I know you're going to catch me with that. But again, it, to me, it's it's not necessarily about numbers, but it's about Im the impression they're trying to go for. Uh, and I think I'm a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe I'm similar to yours in that sense, Chris, where it's like, um, you you know, y the crossovers I'm thinking of are, are the same as the crossovers you're thinking of, where they're never meant to go off road. Mm -hmm. They're just meant to give the impression that they can do those things, um, but they can't actually do them. Sure. So, Greg, going back to your definition of the SUV crossover debate, I guess it doesn't seem that you are allowing much wiggle room, that you are kind of the, the body on frame SUV, not body on frame crossover. And then there's something that's going to be a five door five door hatchback. What where do you see? Where do you see the line? I guess where what is a five door hatchback and what is a crossover? 
Oh, that's what I was trying to figure out too. I think it's probably an H point or a ground clearance thing. We we need to define it. So that's our our well, goal, I guess. Let's find out what it is. It's H point or ground clearance, I guess, because that 500L, the H point's high enough that it's got to be a crosser. But the ground clearance is 4.7 inches, and that's pretty low. So what about the availability of all wheel drive to you? Is that a requirement? No, because I've accepted Nissan Kicks, Toyota CHR, and to me, Kia Soul are all crossovers. And 500L. That can be a crossover in my world, too. Wow. Okay. So so I, it sounds to me like hit point is more um, a, more a defining factor than ground clearance. Well, like Chevy calls the Bolt a crossover. Do you agree with that or no? No. I think no, that's God, pure no. marketing uh, speak. I'm willing to give it to them and say it's a crossover because that's it's like just an V. It's not a normal no, hatchback, that's, but the H point's so high. It's a hatchback. I it's mean, a, yeah, it, it's just a tall hatchback. Yeah. Like, like the 500L is just a tall hatchback. Isn't the 500X, though? The 500X is a crossover because that has ground clearance. That is trying to give you the impression of it being an SUV. Off-road ability is not defining SUVs for me. A Jeep XJ, that's a crossover, unibody. Original, or I don't know for the original, but the last... Wow. The Nissan Pathfinders that were that were unibody crossovers, not the front-wheel drive ones that we have now. The ones that were yeah, the body. Yeah, you know, Eddie Murphy drove one in Doctor Doolittle in 1997. Wait, which Jeep did you did you pull out? XJ oh, is a Cherokee, isn't it? Yeah, the XJ Cherokee. Those those were a unibody, correct? Yes. I, yeah. I can't follow you down that road just because saying those words out loud, like attaching crossover to uh, such historically rugged vehicles as. You know the the old Jeep Cherokees and and even the current Grand Cherokees. I just that doesn't that doesn't sound right in my brain. I can't I can't say that and feel like I'm saying something that's correct. Agreed. Well, if Jeep was smart, they'd take this, run with it, and use their marketing money to be like, we invented the crossover with the <laughs> Cherokee. I, I'm sure Here's we could find another you know body SUV before it, but we are automotive journalists. We write about these vehicles all the time and we want to get our descriptions correct. However, there's a whole nother group of people called marketing departments who know that the word crossover is a word that not everybody is using or understands. What they know from their own research is that everybody uses the word SUV. Everybody searches the word SUV on Google. Everybody likes the word SUV. So they will take their crossovers and just call them SUVs. You know, they won't make any uh, conditional. They won't call them crossover SUVs. You know, they'll just say, this is our lineup of SUVs. And that kind of... um, I can't follow that because that's just marketing trying to trick you into thinking this is a legitimate SUV and you want to be a guy on your block who has an SUV. But, you know, really you're buying a Nissan Pathfinder that is that, you know, none of us would classify today as an SUV. So I think marketing teams and their commercials and their advertising uh, just muddy the waters even more for both regular people and automotive enthusiasts and journalists who are trying to, you know, agree on on how to classify these vehicles. I think you make a really good point there, especially if you broaden it out to just the general car buying public in total. We're sitting here discussing this because we have to write about these vehicles all the time and words mean things and it's important to use the right one whereas if i talk to my parents or you know friends or anything like that they're going to call just about everything an suv or even just use suv and crossover interchangeably because the word suv has been around for so much longer and has been applied to so many more vehicles that it's just amongst the general public that's just what these vehicles are whether or not we want to call them that. Ironically, as time has gone by and crossovers have increased in number, there are so few actual SUVs left. If we all agreed on what the definition of an SUV is, which is body on frame and off-road and all of that, I mean, there's a handful of them left. You know, there's um, Toyota 4Runner. There's um, Sequoia. Land Sequoia, Cruiser. Sequoia. Land Cruiser. LX570. Well, GX460. that's a uh, Expedition. Navigator. Armada. QX80. You're going to run out pretty soon. Um, no, there's a fair amount of these. Ta- Tahoe Suburban. G- G-Class. Tahoe Suburban. Yukon. The new G-Class, I don't know, is body on frame. It's body on frame. We got a fair amount left, but they're not really a lot of affordable ones, if you'll notice that. Well, oh, yeah, they're all huge. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Nothing like, um, what was the what was the Nissan uh, body on frame one? 
that got discontinued. That X-Terra, was the Terra or G, or the little Terra tracker, you know. No, I was thinking of the Xterra. That was a great uh, body on frame SUV uh, for the time. I'd, lo- I'd I'd rock one of those now if we could find one uh, with low mileage. Um, but you're right; they're kind of um, uh, true SUVs today are usually large in size and high in price, um, and their benefits are usually not even off road anymore. They're it's towing, right? You know, a body on frame SUV with a big V8 can tow a lot more than than a crossover. But even then, like the Durango can tow very well and it's a crossover. I mean, it can, it can tow. You're right. It, it's I would. Well, again, that would be the exception to the rule, I think, uh, because it's one of the few crossovers with a with a optional burly V8. If you want a, an SUV that can tow over 10,000 pounds, let's say, you know, it's going to be a tried and true, you know, SUV and, and not a crossover. I think the Durango goes up to seven or eight thousand pounds. Which is high, but again, not as high as the true truck-based SUVs. But that's about all they're good for. I mean, it's not it's not off-road ability anymore. More, I think, towing. I think there's an argument for it because the great off-roaders are still body on frame. Wrangler, uh, G-Class. You know, I'm not an engineer, but it seems like there's a there's a common pattern. So I have a feeling that there is, you know, an off-road ability element. But they can make unibody chassis do really well off-road. Right. And I think a lot of the SUVs, true SUVs they do make these days are just aren't designed for off-roading like uh, a, Ra- a Wrangler is, you know. Right. So it may have been the case back in the day, you know, 20 years ago where a lot of the true SUVs, you know, were built with more kind of off-road ability baked in. But I think that's kind of fallen out of favor and left to the to the specialist vehicles like the Wrangler to carry on. And the rest are just kind of big boats that tow a lot, like a, like a Suburban or a, you know, something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm simplifying it. Maybe there are still some really good off-roaders, but I think what you said, which is, you know, they've done amazing things with crossovers in terms of their off-road ability. When you put really sophisticated all wheel drive systems in, um, and, and suspensions, like they can do, they can do pretty well off-road too. The Grand Cherokee and the Land Rovers are all testaments to it. Yeah. Trail rated. I don't think we've come to an agreement. (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? I actually, when I'm writing these, when I'm writing reviews of a crossover, I never say just crossover. I always write it as crossover SUV. And I think that's because it goes back to my, my definition of the whole point of a crossover is to give the impression of an SUV, um, as well as the fact that marketers are going to call these SUVs anyway. So I don't want to confuse readers by calling something just a crossover when they're expecting to see the word SUV next to it. Well, I let's not forget, sense. we're web writers. So, you know, crossover and SUV, we can get both those SEO terms in. <laughs> that and the ink's free. You know, yeah. we're not we're not <laughs> we're not buying paper by the word. So, well, and I think we did come to a, a, a conclusion, maybe where we don't all agree with it, but just go by the Justice Potter Stewart thing. I know it when I see it. If you think it's a crossover, it's a crossover. If you see it as an SUV, it's an SUV. Tesla Model X crossover. Yeah, it's a crossover. It's barely like an SUV shape, and it doesn't really have ground clearance. I mean, the shape isn't that different from like an X6 or something yeah. like that. Yeah, but well, that's another great point. You have cr- you have crossover coupes now that clearly don't have like an SUV shape with the just the straight box going back over the cargo hold. They have these sleek coupe profiles. And the only thing that, that those are similar to from, from years ago were like the lifted sedans, the Subaru Legacy Outback sedan um, and stuff like that. Like that wasn't really a connection to me to like SUVs of, of old. Those are, uh, see, this, this is what annoys me about crossovers. By its very nature, it's not definable because it's a crossover of multiple things. So. Right. People are just jamming all this stuff into it. And I don't know, maybe the only defining factor is ground clearance, but it's not even that because like I said, you could have a a Model X, you could have, some people would argue the uh, Fiat 500. um, Ford Flex. I would not call that a crossover or an SUV, obviously, but no. You'd consider it a wagon? Is that what you're thinking? No, man, I don't know. See, I think that's a crossover, but. Really, so when you, when we say, I'll know it when I see it, you see a a Ford uh, Flex and you say crossover? Yes. See, I would define, I think your definition of it being a crossover is fine because it kind of fits the mold, but I know it when I see it and I see it as a minivan. 
Oh, geez. A oh, it's not a minivan? No, it's got... If it's anything, got it's a doors. wagon. I would accept wagon. It's not yeah, a minivan. The Mazda MPV and the first-gen Honda Odyssey had rear doors. They were still learning. Uh, yeah, I, that was... Well, yeah, first, I, I would barely call the first-gen Honda Odyssey a minivan. Uh, and what was the other one? The Mazda MPV. Ugh, same thing. That was they were they were still learning. They were they needed to crawl before they could they could walk. What about the Kia Rondo? Yeah, no, not a everyone minivan. has forgotten about the Kia Rondo. You should too. No, tall, I know. I was just in back. Canada, and there's a the second gen Kia Rondo is there, or second gen for North America is there, and it is awesome. And I wish they'd bring it back. Mm, I, I I would have called it a tall hatchback. It competed with the Mazda Five though, and the Mazda Five was not the a Mazda minivan? Five was always a weird one though, is because it was a mini had, minivan. It had sliding doors. Sliding doors is what defines a minivan. I think you got to call it a, a, a major component of being a minivan. Yeah, agreed. I, I don't agree with that. I think that you can have non-sliding doors and see. Still you're be getting a into this European MPV thing. Yeah, yeah I do stay, think stick we need to have MPVs here. We need to qualify a term for MPVs because a lot of these, I would say, all right, that's just an MPV like the Ford Flex. What about vans? Not the minivans, just vans. Do they have to have sliding doors? Because no, because okay. commercial vans can have regular doors. Yeah, that's a, okay. So why can't minivans have regular doors? That's just the way it is. That's just the way the laws of nature were set up. I didn't make them. I'm just observing them. I'm not sure I agree with this, but I'll accept it. Name name a current. Well, okay, what what's your example of a current minivan on sale today that doesn't have sliding doors? Ford Flex. No. 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 <laughs> that can't be. Kia Rondo in in Canada. Uh, I think it's called Kia Rondo. No, there you got You got to stay in the states. I'm gonna. Uh, a you minivan gotta, without sliding doors here. Mercedes R Class was that a minivan? That was a minivan. Or a crossover? No, that or, was not a minivan. That was a minivan. Same. same I mean, it was Chry- an MPV technically. But, same with right. same with Chrysler. The old, the first gen Chrysler Pacifica. Also not a minivan. Also not a crossover. I no, would. No, that call was a it, crossover. I'd say. Uh, yeah, I think they both are. But what, what about the Toyota Venza? What was that? That was a crossover. That was a crossover. That yeah. was a crossover. The Pacifica was basically like a Chrysler version of a Venza. Actually, the Venza, I guess, was no, the Toyota Venza, version with five seats instead of the Venza. Really. Again, the Venza had like an SUV shape, which to me is part of my definition of a crossover. The others you're talking about, the R Class and the Pacifica, did not have an SUV shape. They what had about the more... Flex though? That's got a very SUV shape. It's boxy. no, it doesn't. It, yes, it it's, does. It's, it's 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 boxy, but it's long. That's like a suburban though, boxy and long. All of these all of these arguments break down into feelings. I think for all of us, right. like like there's just and, and that's hard. For, I majored in philosophy, where like categorization and like like you're you're trying to explain the unexplainable, and this is why this argument flummoxes me so much because I feel like. At the end of the day, we are all using what you said, Greg, as I'll know it when I see it. The problem is we all get different answers when we do that. And and we stumbled on the flex, and that's a great example, um, as is the Pacifica. It's all these, it's, it's these fringe cases. And I'm not sure if more and more fringe cases are appearing. Uh, it kind of feels like that to me, just because we have more and more um, uh, vehicles, more and more niches being filled by automakers. Yeah. So oh, just going back we, to something real quick, if a Tesla Model X isn't a crossover, in your opinion, what is it? This, see, that's the pro, that's the, where I'm stuck because I I can't I can't just lay it out there that it's not a crossover, and it it doesn't fall into my category of a tall hatchback. Right. Um, okay. What about a minivan? It's not sliding doors, but it's got no. weird doors that do a thing that's sort of sliding. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick crossover for the Model X, but it's not a satisfying fit. We don't have enough categories anymore. Like automakers are just building whatever's in their head, whatever niche they feel they can shove a vehicle in. They'll call it whatever they want to call it. But our jobs are made infinitely harder because we just don't have enough uh, categories to choose from. And we don't have a governing body of of vehicle categories that we can turn to and all vote, you know, that we're going to call these you know, tall hatchbacks and these crossovers and the flex, whatever the flex is and, and stuff. It's just, I don't know. I don't know how these things get coined. I don't know who coined the, the word crossover. That's interesting. We should look into that. Yeah, that's actually could be a good story. The history of the word crossover. Again, the marketers would rather the word crossover didn't exist and everything were an SUV because that's, that's, the, that's the trigger word that people like when they're buying, buying vehicles. I bet Toyota Lexus invented crossover because RX300 was the first real 
you know, unibody car based thing. We'll send them an email and ask, see if they'll take credit for it. Now that I'm thinking about it, I could even see it going back to CRV Route 4. Yeah. Because oh, those yes, that, were yeah. kind of the, you know, where they were car based, but. Because at that time, the, the Ford Explorer was the hottest selling. SUV, but that was still body on frame. Correct. And then the CRV and the RAV4 came out. And remember when we used to call them uh, cute utes and soft rotors and things like that? And now so, they're not so cute anymore. They're pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, grown. yeah. I mean, they could be any size. I mean, size is size is not an indicator of what is or isn't a crossover because they can come in from from itty bitty to massive. Agree. You know. Oh, yeah, just how we used to call them cute utes. You wouldn't call a RAV4 or a CRV a cute ute anymore, though, even though they are crossovers. Still, just because they're not as small. They've grown so much. No, and they, I, I think even back well, then. Well, they've grown just, so much that there are now models underneath them. I feel like we have reached our time limit. I don't, like, <laughs> we're not done. Uh, we'll probably continue this after, the, after we stop recording. Um, and this, uh, like I said at the beginning, this conversation will continue to be had over and over again. Um, I would definitely love to hear what other people think. Um, whoever's listening out there, whoever's reading Motor One, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com. Um, and give us your opinion about what makes a crossover and what makes an SUV. And of course, on our website, motorone.com, you can find us all in the comments. Um, feel free to hop into any article about an SUV and throw in your opinion. So let's move on to a couple bits of news from this past week. Um, we had a few uh, vehicle debuts, and one of them in particular caught my eye, uh, which is the Porsche Cayman GT4 and the Porsche Boxer Spider. So Greg, why don't you tell us about, about that? The most race-ready, I guess you could say, versions of the Boxster and Cayman. And really importantly, they bring the six-cylinder engine back to this model line. You know, the previous ones of the GT4 and Spider were six cylinders, but when the Boxster and Cayman became 718, they became all four cylinders. So it's nice to see six-cylinder back. Those four cylinders were, or are, I assume they're going to be kept around because Porsche invested a lot, but they're kind of janky sounding the one in the regular box from came in has a lot of turbo lag it's nice to see porsche listening to us i guess and saying hey we hear you want six cylinders here's a six cylinder the uh biggest bummer is probably that it's not the flat six from the porsche 911 gt3 it is a new flat six that's supposedly what i've been told based on the flat six that's in the new 911 carrera s and it's got 414 horsepower Probably sounds great. Six-speed manual only. If I had $100,000, I think that's what they're asking. I have the exact price somewhere. Um, it's around, you know, 100000 and some change. 96.3 for the Spider and 99.2 for the GT4 before the 1250 delivery fee. If I had that money, I'd put it down for these cars. There's a little Porsche premium on the top of that. Yeah, but I feel like these cars are so special that... You know, we know how Porsches are. They don't really, they might depreciate a little in the beginning, but eventually they just kind of all end up rising, especially 911s. That's true. Like these are the type of cars. Or a 914 or a 928 or a. I mean, not everyone. The 928s are going up a lot. They're starting to now. Are. You're right. I should, 914s yeah. even are, to be honest. 914s are still affordable, though. The, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this seems like a car that is more of, uh, hopefully people don't use it purely as an investment opportunity. They seem like they want to be driven. But a car that, you know, you don't buy necessarily to drive every day. It's your third car and will probably eventually make you money or lose you not a lot of money and be a ton of fun along the way. I think it's also a little interesting. I remember when they went all four-cylinder and just the amount of convincing and and the the message they were sending that four cylinder is the way to go you know and and all the reasons they gave at the time like weight and things like that uh and now they're kind of turning about face and like you said giving us what we all wanted which was a flat six they're so good even with the four cylinder and the four cylinder is a dog and i assume the four cylinder sticking around we don't have the 2020 718 boxster box dress came and came and asked stuff up yet but i'm sure there'll be four cylinders again but oh, it definitely. is such a good car to drive and if you can get the six cylinder one, even better, but you won't even be disappointed with the four. Let's keep the discussion on horsepower. The uh, Cayman uh, and Cayman GC4 and Boxer Spider, those had 414 horsepower. Let's kick it up a little to 760 horsepower, which is the confirmed 
um, power rating for the 2020 Mustang Shelby uh, GT500. Chris, you were the one who wrote that article. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I did. It was a nice little pleasant uh, surprise this morning. I logged in, and that was the first thing that we saw was uh, Ford officially confirmed the specs. Like you said, 760 horsepower, 625 pound-feet from... 5.2 liter supercharged V8, as far as we know, doesn't have the flat plane crank of the version from the GT350. It's a cross plane, but it should, you know, we've ha- seen videos of it starting up and guys revving it, and it sounds really good. Just a nice burble, and then kind of as you get into it, you get a little bit of that supercharger whine. It's, you know, it's nice to see. Ford has told us that it'll have a sub 11 second uh, quarter mile time. Uh, They've told us the top speed will be limited to 180 miles per hour. So that's interesting. I wonder how fast it can it can actually go. Uh, But no zero to 60 time yet. Right. That's uh, the big question. And price is also the other big question. We can be certain practically that the number is going to be more than the uh, GT350, that starting after you add in the destination is uh, 60,235 right now. So it's definitely going to be more than that. 70, 80 maybe. uh, Those numbers wouldn't shock me at all. And then once you add in dealer markups for the first bunch, I wouldn't be surprised if one sells for 100K just because there's some guy out there that wants to have the first one on the block. I mean, 100K for 760 horsepower. I mean, I, I that used to be a bargain. Uh, but now you can, you know, you look at the, the Challenger Red Eye at 797 horsepower. Um, that offers more horsepower than the GT500, but I'm sure the GT500 is probably an all-around better performing car in terms of handling, um, you know, actually being a road car. Yeah, uh, they're cha- slightly different. The Challenger... So FCA has done something really interesting where they've kind of turned the Challenger into almost like a muscle car slash Grand Tour, whereas Mm -hmm. what we know from the GT500, you know, you're going to be able to get an optional carbon fiber package with carbon fiber wheels and Recaro seats. It's going to be a little bit more, it's going to be a little bit more of a car that you could take to the track if you want to, whereas unless it's a drag strip, I don't think you'd want to take a red eye to that many tracks. No, I think, but that's... That's how the Challenger has been deviating from the Mustang and Camaro for more than a few years now. Yeah. And I don't think it's as much an intentional decision by FCA as it is they didn't have the money to completely redevelop the Challenger. So they just worked with what they had and they could make a great drag strip car. Um, and and that was great for renewing interest and excitement in it. So they went that route, whereas the Mustang and the Camaro had already gone the route of of road racing and becoming better handling cars than than uh, pony cars used to be um, thought of. Um, but y- y- you say that, and the Challenger, Mustang, and Camaro will forever be linked as competitors, no matter kind of how far the the Challenger. And, uh, might stray from the other two so you know the fact 760 horsepower ford knows that that's that that was always going to be compared to the um challenger 797 and whatever fc fci does with the challenger um honestly it's more than we expected i remember we we wrote a post just a, a week or two ago that ford hinted at what it could be by writing 700 plus plus right. and i think it was a social media post and we all wondered what that means, what that meant, and definitely it meant more than we expected because 760 um, is is considerably more than just over 700. Yeah, Ford played their cards close to the hand this time. They always said over 700, but they would never kind of go over that. And you know, generally when you hear an automaker say over 700, you know, maybe that means 710, 720, but 760 is definitely over 700 and quite a bit more. So they did a. They kept people interested for a while with that line of thinking. I still want to know what it's going to feel like getting to top speed in this car since it's governed to 180. I feel like maybe that wing has a lot of drag, so it slows it down. But if it doesn't have a ton of drag, it's going to be like hitting a brick wall when you hit that 180 (laughs) mile per hour speed speed limiter. We've been publishing a lot of top speed videos um, of cars, and a lot of them can go faster than what the automakers say. Right. um, Even when there are limiters. Um, So it'll be interesting if someone can get their hands on a new GT500 and a really, really long stretch of pavement to find out if 180 uh, really is the uh, the top speed or if it's just a suggestion. Um, 
All right, well, we'd love to hear what you think about the GT500, the Porsche Cayman and Boxster, and our discussion of what makes a crossover and an SUV. I'm sure a lot of people have opinions about that. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, uh, where all of these discussions will continue. And of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us in the comments. And coming up, you'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And please hit the subscribe button so you get uh, every new episode and leave a review if you can. Our final segment of the episode is What Are We Driving This Week, where we go around the table and we talk a little bit about what we've been getting behind the wheel of lately. So, Chris, let's start with you. What have you been driving this week? So, I have been driving this week the same car I've been driving for coming up on 14 years now. Uh, I have a 2006 Mini Cooper. I got it from new, delivered October 31st, 2005. Got my wife through uh, um, graduate school and still- How many miles? Uh, it's just about to hit 60 K. Oh, that's not bad. That's, yeah. that's really good for, for how old it is. What, uh, is it an S? Is it, it is not an S it is a, straight a coupe. Yeah. Just a coupe with the, uh, five speed. Wow. But so. to me, that is, that is the only generation mini Cooper to get. I yeah. Mean, that the, so was, the, the 06 is the final model year. So I have perfect. been, they kind of have a reputation for being not super reliable, but I guess I got one of the last ones and they kind of fixed a lot of the stuff and. Mine has been largely hassle-free. It's just every generation, while they've gotten nicer and had more features and more technologically advanced, they have just gotten bigger and heavier. And when your name is Mini, that is just a tough pill to swallow. Like the first one, I I just felt, even though the first one, your your generation is still considerably larger than the original Mini, Sure, we're just, we're never going to have a car the size of the original Mini ever again with, you know, safety requirements and all that. But the first one at least embodied, like embodied that physically. Like it was mm-hmm. still smaller than anything else on the road at the time, uh, and would still be considered very small today. Whereas the the current Mini Cooper is, you know, a, a, a three door hatchback of decent size. Yeah. Let's say. Yeah. Also, its proportions were so much better than the later ones. Yeah. Yeah, it was like it was leaner. I feel like the the current ones are a little, they're, they're the proportions are a little chubby. Yes, thank you. That was perfect. That was yeah. perfect. Um, so, but in regards to mine, it is starting to show its age a little bit. This weekend, I had to. So you know, the high mounted third brake light on the back. I don't know when it happened. I don't know how it happened. But the red uh, covering that's around it, the uh, the lamp portion, mm-hmm. it came off somewhere. So I just had the lights and the chrome strip that they kind of reflect off of. So since there was many only sells it as a complete thing, as a complete oh, unit, since they were glued, glued together originally. So had to how buy one. It, how much does it cost? Uh, it was 76 plus shipping. So I think all in, I was like 95. Ugh, damn. Well, that's that is one thing about owning a Mini Cooper, even the first gen. It's. Got, it, I mean, it, it it had premium parts. I mean, it had some BMW parts and, and it mostly bit, BMW parts. I mean, if you BMW. look on mine, if you look on the indoor, you know, it was made in the UK, but it does say Bayerisch and Motor and Verka. So it's, you know, it's a BMW in, a, in its own little way. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. So the parts, the individual parts to replace when, when the time comes are, are definitely more expensive than average. But um, it was kind of funny, though. So the place that I ordered it from, they were genuine mini parts and they sent it to me and they had the build date on them. And the build date for the part that I put on was older than the one that I had to remove because they both had their little stamps on oh them. My God. So <laughs> it, this thing had been sitting on a uh, counter somewhere for almost you know 14 years i think it was from uh 04 so and somebody still made 70 bucks off it yeah exactly excellent all right greg uh what have you been driving this week i'm in the long-term honda pilot that uh our friend co-worker clint simone has been taking care of all this time he's out this week and I get to be with it. It's in great shape still. I think it has 6,000 miles on it. It is, it is in need of a service soon, it keeps telling me. So I'm going to have to let Clint know about that. But yeah, it's... And we've we've named her, haven't we? What's her oh, name? Tracy Chapman. 
Tracy Chapman. Yeah, she's a good one. Um, I have to say, whenever I go down to the Miami office where where you guys keep her, um, the color on this pilot is just an excellent color. It's like a steely, very steel blue kind of. Um, it, it looks it looks absolutely sharp. And we got how how many months ago did we get it in our fleet? Oh, it's got to be like five or six months. This thing going months. away very soon. It, it, it's funny to me. Yeah, it is going away soon. It's funny to me that when we got it, it was state of the art, fully loaded, had everything you could ask for. And six months later, I feel like we're going on um, first drive trips to 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 drive brand new uh, three row SUVs that are already kind of making it feel dated with all the new stuff they have in them. So it, it has made me it has reminded me how fast uh, the cycle goes uh, with these vehicles and a, a vehicle that felt new six to 12 months ago can already feel like it's not the newest thing on the block. Yeah, especially in technology. Like, it still drives very new and modern feeling. I mean, it's m- kind of minivan-like, if you know, you don't mind. But, um, yeah, the fact it doesn't have, like, a 360-degree camera and we're, you know, right. top-of-the-line one. And, I mean, it's fine. you got sensors. It's not like it's totally necessary, but it is something that seems like a minor oversight where most other vehicles in this class would have that at the top-of-the-line model. Right, exactly, exactly. But it's been a it's been a great warrior um, for us down there in Miami. I even got to drive it across state, and uh, I drove um, Alligator Alley with it. Did not see an alligator, but uh, the pilot did extremely well. It was just you know uh, very comfortable and a, <laughs> a joy to drive in a straight line for an hour and a half. Well, it's perfect. We got a passport coming in at the end of the week, so I'm kind of gonna mm-hmm. be able to juxtapose what the cutting of inches off the back of the car did to dynamics or whatever yeah that'll be interesting that'll be interesting okay so in my driveway i have uh, yet another bmw this is my third one in a row and is not even the last uh uh, after the m2 competition after the m5 competition that i talked about last week i now have uh, an x5 um Specifically, an X5 X Drive 50i, which means it has the uh, 4.4 liter turbo V8, uh, lots of horsepower, I think somewhere in the mid 400 range. Um, and I've only driven it uh, a couple days, but man, this might be the best BMW I've driven to date uh, in terms of specifically the interior. Like, I did not know, and, and not based on the M2 or the M5, that BMW interiors have gotten so good. Um, the X5 is, is the example of that, and I'm really enjoying it. It's super comfortable, super, it feels super high-end, um, and it should. It's, it's $92,000 out the door. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, living up to that price right now. So what uh, feels so good about it? Well, for one, okay, this is going to be this is going to sound silly, but when I get to the really expensive luxury vehicles, I like to judge them a little bit on their headrests. Mm-hmm. And the headrest of the this X5 feel like pillows. And when you get headrests like that, I feel you've really stepped into luxury territory. Like the the S class has those pillowy uh headrests and and like Bentleys do and and Rolls-Royces. And I know it's silly, but nothing says like you've made it and you've spent an obscene amount of money on a vehicle than putting your head back into just a soft leather pillow rather than this kind of, you know, hard, unforgiving, cheap leather uh, headrest that most cars have. So I'm not judging it entirely on that. But in terms of impressions, that added greatly to it for me. Um, But other other things like... um, the the screen is is really nice um it's it's a you know it's not like a giant screen like a a tesla or a you know a volvo uh but it's really big really wide um super sharp graphics they've got a lot of um crystal bits and that might sound weird but like the shifter um the push start button those are all crystal and they've got kind of facets to them like they're cut like a diamond um, which BMW kind of stole from from Volvo, but um, it definitely imparts a feeling of you know um, something be, being like really fine and and expensive. Um, so How does it ride? Since you know you're in northeastern Ohio, Cleveland, that area doesn't have the most the smoothest <laughs> roads. Things can get bumpy. How does it feel? 
So when I put it on comfort, it is really comfortable. And by that, I mean the suspension is super soft, super forgiving, and you don't feel anything you're driving over. However, it's good for driving over bad roads, but in terms of of body movement, um, there's a lot of it. Um, and then like all, like, well, like most BMWs, you can choose different, you know, modes, um, and you can firm it up. Uh, but then it quickly gets too firm and where it's great for handling, but then you, you wouldn't want to, um, drive it in that, um, kind of higher performance mode all the time because it, it, it sucks over potholes and, and bad roads. So, um, that's the one thing about BMWs is they've, they've kind of gone from where, um, they used to have kind of like a, to me, like a, a suspension tune before they had variable suspensions where it was just like, it could do both things really well. It could, mm-hmm. it could handle really well, but it also was really composed and comfortable over bad roads to now where you, you have to always be picking the right mode to be in for whatever road you're on or whatever you want to do. And that's fine. I mean, the, the specific modes are very good at what they're designed to do, but you know, it's hard to it's hard to pick one and leave it in it all the time. Um, for now, I'm leaving it in comfort because uh, I'm in the suburbs and I basically have straight roads, 90 degree right turns, and the roads are pretty bad. But I, I will seek out a back road with some curves and crank up the the performance mode and and see how it does because there is a lot of power to work with, even though it's a big vehicle. So um, I expect it to handle pretty well. But but we will we will see. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Um, you can follow Greg on Twitter at the Thinker. Uh, you can follow Chris at Chris Bruce 1985, and you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you both for being here with me. Thanks, Thanks for John. having me, and of course, thank all of you out there for listening. See you next week.